Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed guests, uh, distinguished faculty, uh, uh, staff and students. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, start our lecture this uh, afternoon as part of our Purdue Engineering Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Uh, the introduction of our speaker today uh, will be done uh, by the Dean of the College of Engineering. And I have the distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Mang Chiang. Uh, Mang is the John A. Edwardson Dean of the College of Engineering and the Roscoe H. George Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Purdue University. Uh, previously, he was the author of the Grand Dodi uh, Professor of Electrical Engineering one of the youngest endowed shared professors at Princeton University before he came here uh, to Purdue as a dean. Uh, he received his uh, BS, MS, and PhD degrees all from Stanford. And uh, for his research, he received the 2013 Alan T. Waterman Award as one of the many recognitions that he has received over his career. Uh, his online courses and textbooks reached uh, over 25 uh, 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 250,000 uh, students, so a uh, significant uh, distribution, and he co-founded several startup companies and a nonprofit consortium. Um, I had the great pleasure to work with Mang uh, as an associate dean for undergraduate and graduate education, and on a personal basis, I, I truly enjoyed his uh, tremendous vision for the college, uh, his never ending amount of new energy, uh, of new ideas that uh, he brings uh, uh, to the play, to the meetings, and his tremendous energy in getting things done. Uh, so it's my great pleasure. Uh, please welcome, uh, help me welcome uh, Dean Mark Chang. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, It was great to work with you. Uh, and uh, thank you and congratulations on your outstanding uh, work leading our great School of Mechanical Engineering. And uh, it is my distinct honor to welcome you and to introduce all of you to today's Purdue Engineering Distinguished uh, Lecture. And I want to start by highlighting that uh, achieving the pinnacle of excellence at scale is an aspiration for all of us here, Boilermaker Engineers in Purdue Engineering. And because of the efforts and success of our faculty, students, and staff, uh, our ranking, for example, of our graduate and research program uh, has been uh, rapidly rising uh, in recent years. And this year we are ranked number four in the United States by US News. And uh, equally importantly, uh, we educate uh, 14,000 students in residence and uh, several thousand more online uh, in this truly pinnacle of excellence at scale. And part of what we do is to invite outstanding speakers to campus, perhaps virtually or hybrid uh, right now. And uh, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series was created several years ago to bring in on average about eight uh, such distinguished lectures from all over the world, from academia, industry, and government uh, to Purdue Engineering. And today we are very excited and delighted to welcome Professor Victor Castano to Purdue. And Victor is a recognized international leader, and uh, I will not uh, uh, have the time in this brief introduction to read his entire resume, uh, but he has been known as a innovative leader in research in multiple areas uh, throughout 800 different articles and many of the students that he supervised. In particular, uh, Victor is the founding director of the Center for Applied Physics and Advanced Technologies of the um, National Autonomous University uh, of Mexico. And I have heard also that uh, Victor is uh, the only member of all three academies of Mexico, the Academy of Engineering, of Science, and of Medicine uh, in Mexico. Uh, we are delighted to be able to have a chance to uh, talk to Victor during the virtual visit here uh, at the panel. And uh, we are so looking forward 
uh, Victor, to your uh, distinguished lecture coming up. Thank you so much for visiting us and welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It is an honor and a real pleasure to be with you. Uh, and I would like to uh, share with you today uh, my personal experiences going through the pandemics in, uh, in the last uh, 14 months. First of all, let me tell you that uh, the academia has changed in the last year. And uh, this article last December by Nature uh, says that the, indeed science before and after uh, COVID-19 is different for a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, as you see here, there is a cascade of articles. It is uh, incredible the amount of articles that in uh, 10 months have been published in things related to uh, uh, COVID or, uh, or uh, related uh, diseases. The only, the other thing that uh, we noticed, uh, and it was uh, uh, pointed out during the panel, is that this also has uh, uh, demonstrated uh, a gap between uh, male and females. You can see here in this plot that the, the amount of papers uh, po uh, submitted to uh, Elsevier journals uh, includes more men than women. And uh, that's also uh, a gender call of attention that we need to pay attention to. The second thing is that the, the uh, topic of the different articles is changed. At the beginning, there was uh, a cascade of articles related to models, how the epidemic is uh, growing. And as you see, this is declining. But what this uh, uh, taking uh, a very accelerated pace is the mental health. Mental health is one of the forgotten uh, consequences of uh, the pandemic. And all of this uh, affects us either as citizens, as students, and as uh, professors in universities all over the world. So what are the skills we need to navigate through this pandemic? Skill number one, we have to determine where we are, exactly where we are. And to do that, please allow me to invite you to visit uh, virtually Paris. Uh, about 10 years ago, my wife and I visited Paris and wandering around, we discovered this little known museum is the Museum of Medieval Art. It's not the Louvre, it's not one of the most famous museums, but in my opinion, it's one of the finest ones. And uh, after that trip, I have been uh, uh, able to go to, uh, to France, to Paris quite often. And my wife asked me to go and to visit again, to get some souvenirs at this uh, 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 museum. I kind of remembered that this museum was uh, not far from Notre Dame. I went there. And for about four or five years, I was unable to locate this museum. And uh, until it came to my mind that uh, all I need to locate this is a map. And uh, when you see the map, it is clear what it is. This is Notre Dame. This is the Sorbonne, the University of Mexico where I work has a facility here. And I asked them where this uh, museum, the Cluny Museum was, uh, located and nobody knew. And the reason is that the, the museum is not in a, in a, a main street, but in a lateral side of the street, uh, very small. And the second reason is that the facade of the museum has changed. And uh, I walk in front of this museum several times, and I was hoping to look at this. This uh, thing is still there, but behind this new, this new uh, front. So the lesson I want to share with you is that to find where we are, we need a map, of course. But we need a map of knowledge. A map of knowledge is, is, is a way to 
understand where are the concepts of knowledge that are relevant to, what, to the problem we are looking at. As you saw, Nature reports over 200,000 papers in 10 months published related to COVID. It is impossible to revise all of them. What of those papers are relevant? The ones published in Nature or Science, the one published in uh, health-related uh, journals, in engineering journals. And not only that, what's the relation of this knowledge with, this, with the strategies and the processes that we want to pursue? So asking ourselves this question, and after this experience in Paris, one student of mine and I, uh, Cesar Aguado, decided to construct a map a translation and knowledge map of COVID-19. This was, was published uh, last November in this journal, a journal of pharmacovigilance. Uh, and uh, what we found was the following. First, uh, the knowledge map allows us to know what the strategic knowledge this knowledge could be, uh, most of the time is scattered and is not available at the time and the place where it is needed. Most importantly, it is available to only a few people and not and sometimes not to the people who are uh, the keys to solve the problem. So that's what we need from a knowledge map. Let me uh, first uh, recall you that the coronaviruses are by no means new. They were first reported in 1965 uh, from uh, a couple of medical doctors who were looking for a, an unknown uh, kind of cold. And in 1968, the first uh, electron microscopy uh, images were published, and uh, the term coronavirus was uh, coined at the time. Uh, it was found that the, uh, this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, belongs to the B lineage of Vera cor uh, coronaviruses, and is, it is uh, related to the uh, SARS-CoV virus. First thing what, what we did in this knowledge map, uh, which was uh, produced by uh, uh, inventing, by uh, developing a, a bot that goes through millions and millions and millions of articles, paper, theses to, uh, uh, to do uh, through artificial intelligence a mapping of what we have is the following. First, that the first uh, virus discovered in 1965, after five, 55 years, has evolved in a very wide variety of, uh, of different uh, viruses, and this is increasing. In the last uh, year or so, we have discovered at least 20 more variants of the ones that are described here. So to our knowledge, this is the very first lineage mapping of the virus. And this is important because we need to know uh, the structural relationship between uh, a, a given type of virus and another one and how we are going to deal with it. The second thing is that uh, uh, in the last few years, nobody pay attention to uh, coronavirus. This is, these are the number of papers. And you see that this is the average number of papers. And uh, in the last uh, uh, in 10 years, it was a decline of, of the interest in, coronavi in coronavirus until that in 1916, a company in Wuhan uh, filed for a patent on this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that attracted the attention of the literature, and obviously in 1920, this, uh, uh, the number of papers have grown exponentially. Analyzing all the data available, millions and millions of data reports and articles, you find this very complex, complex uh, structure of concepts related to coronavirus. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to go, you can start from China, but you can see that there are many concepts related to that, and it is impossible to decide where to begin with. 
by doing this intellig uh, artificial intelligence analysis, we found that the, all this data can be mapped into these five different groups of concepts. And the important thing here is that the, in spite of all the thousands of articles, papers, uh, reports, patents that are about COVID-19, please pay attention, this is COVID-19 as a disease, we have isles, islands of knowledge. No matter how big is this, how big is this, how much effort we put into that or into this, the, whereas we don't have uh, a connection between these islands, then we have no hope to get a good picture. This uh, also is also hierarchically uh, arranged, as you can see here, how each of these islands contain different concepts that uh, can go on and on and on, and how are related these gaps here means that there is no connection between these gaps. But on the other hand, this is the conceptual map of SARS-CoV-2, that is the virus. And in this case, we see that uh, at least some of the concepts are related to each other. Please compare this map in which you have islands connected with this island in which there is no connection. Remember, this is COVID, the disease, and this is SARS-CoV-2, the virus. And this uh, brings me to an important lesson. To know where we are, we need a map but also we need to be able to uh, construct a map of what we need. We, of course, are interested in uh, the details of uh, the virus, but most importantly, as citizens of the world, we are concerned with the relevance of the disease, which is what really affects us. The other uh, important thing here is What's the amount of research done in, around the world on, uh, on uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the last uh, 30 years? And uh, it, it is very interesting because you see that the places uh, where there is more research, not surprisingly, there are the places where the vaccine has been developed. Perhaps the only exception is Russia, which had no report on this SARS-CoV in the last 20 years. But interestingly enough, they had uh, relations with China, which developed uh, its vaccine, and with Mexico, which had a long tradition of uh, doing uh, uh, research in virus, but not in the disease. And the ones who, take, who took advantage of this knowledge in the virus to, to fight the disease were the Russians. So that's another lesson of this map. We need to know where we are and how we are going to use the knowledge available to us. Second skill we need. Once we know where we are, we need to determine where are we going. Perhaps the first article, which was published in uh, March 2020 uh, on the modeling of the epidemics was uh, this paper uh, uh, made by uh, some co-workers uh, in, uh, in France, Senegal, and China, uh, where they uh, pointed out that the latency period of COVID-19 was important. So, that the, there, were, there was a period of around 14 days in which people may show no symptoms, but still they were able to infect others. Based on that, uh, uh, some other people uh, was uh, able to produce what uh, AJ uh, mentioned at the panel, that the masks and the uh, social distancing was still one of the most important uh, measures to, uh, uh, to take against uh, COVID. This is an article 
of July 10, 2020. Based on that, uh, a colleague of mine who's an expert in nonlinear thermo thermodynamics, Ivan Santa Maria Holick, and myself, uh, produced perhaps the first article on the future of the pandemic. Well, what are the possible fates of the spread? Okay, we can describe how the, uh, uh, the, uh, the disease are, uh, are uh, spreading, but what we really need to know is what are the fates, what's the future? What, where are we going? and how we can prepare ourselves. So what we did is to produce, uh, we took this uh, concept of nonlinear thermodynamics uh, to produce these equations in which we took into account not only the infected and the active uh, persons, but also the recovered, the susceptible people and people who were not aware, but were infecting others. If you take that into account, we were able to uh, produce various scenarios of how the pandemic was going to, to be in the, in the uh, uh, following months. This was published in October. And up to now, we have a coincidence with the uh, uh, official uh, uh, figures by the government of Mexico of about 96%. This is important because this is not a, a fit of data as most articles. This is a prediction of how we are going to do in, uh, in this. And you have, you have here different scenarios depending on how people susceptible and active are going to interact. And the, uh, the lesson, it's uh, basically the same. The best we can do is to keep isolated from each other because we don't know for sure whether we are infected or not. Then we know where we are, we know where are we going, but if we are going to travel somewhere, we need to determine the risks around us. And uh, let me show you uh, this uh, 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 plot, this uh, graph of the market of global surface disinfectants. It is a multimillionaire uh, market in the United States. These are data from uh, 2017. And uh, it, at that time, it, it was over $1.2 billion uh, worth of uh, market. Today, nobody knows for sure, but it should be at least double of this. Most of the, uh, of the products are uh, uh, quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, the most known uh, um, uh, brand of this is uh, Lysol. And uh, in the case of, uh, of North America and Mexico, in uh, 19, uh, 2019, the expected growth of this market was over 8% and 7%. Very good. Market that grows 8% a year is very good. My last calculation is that it has grown almost 20%. And the reason being that uh, uh, until uh, 2019, most of the use of uh, this uh, surface disinfectants was in the industrial and institutional. A little residential, and little commercial. Now, after the pandemic, it has, it, it has changed completely this picture. Nobody again knows for sure how this market has changed. All we know is that it is different because of this pandemic, and it is also much bigger than uh, two years ago. But what the people don't really pay attention to is a report like this. This is a report one year ago from the National Poison Data System of the United States. This uh, is an office of the uh, American government that follows poisoning cases 
all over the, uh, the United States to detect whether or not there is an accident or a, a, a problem that should be looked at. Let's look at this. This is uh, the plot of cleaners, and this is the plot of disinfectants. Year 2018, 2019, and you can see a very standard procedure. Some months, uh, there are more, some other are less, but the average is the same in the last 20 years. And of course, in the year 2020, at the beginning of March, there was a tremendous increase in people uh, poisoned or intoxicated with this. And the same with disinfectants and cleaners. That's uh, natural, that's very clear because we are exposed to chemicals that we were not used to. Every single day, each of us uh, use uh, cleaners, disinfectants, gels, and uh, how that affects the, uh, the health, that's a question that remains to be solved. So to solve that, we need to develop another skill. Develop the skill that we need to survive. And of course, we have no time to go to the library to look for, uh, for uh, all the research that has been done, especially if we don't have a map. As the, as the one I showed you before. So we need to look around what we have to survive. And let me show you perhaps the most important, the most common diagram of, uh, of all of us that the, all of us require to survive. This one. This is an electronic uh, description of photosynthesis. Thanks to photosynthesis, uh, there is life in this planet. If this process here, that is basically plants are not able to produce energy and food from solar light, we will be gone. All life will be gone from this planet. So how we use this to survive? And the way we uh, use this concept is to find, uh, of course, we are not able yet to produce artificial photosynthesis, but we are able to produce photocatalysis. I know there are many people in uh, Purdue that do photocatalysis for various applications. And uh, that's a concept that is being used all over the world for or uh, different technologies. And photocatalysis and photosynthesis are similar in principle, but the difference lies on uh, basic science. Photocatalysis promotes reactions with uh, delta G below zero, whereas photosynthetic devices use the energy to drive reaction with delta G uh, uh, bigger than zero. This difference between here and here is what we call life. So how we are able to use photocatalysis to, uh, to produce and to interact with life. And uh, the way to do that is through a uh, technology that we developed in which photocatalytic nanoparticles that we design uh, is a uh, uh, desired not commercial nanoparticles, we uh, design and uh, build these uh, uh, nanoparticles. And they uh, produce photocatalysis and is converted in photosynthetic when they interact with microorganisms. When they do that, where if you stay, stay here, you, you have delta G, enthalpy below zero. When you interact with the uh, within a microorganism, you, you have enthalpy bigger than, uh, than zero. These are uh, commercial uh, products already. They produce a, a Mexican company over 1 million liters a month in different presentations, gels, liquids, uh, and foam. Uh, 
we have tested with uh, a bunch of uh, gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, fungus, uh, and all uh, type of uh, microorganisms, not only bacteria and viruses, uh, including hepatitis B, hepatitis C, BHE, and most importantly, coronavirus. Until uh, about a month ago, uh, we were able to test it with uh, SARS-CoV, which is uh, the closest relative to SARS-CoV-2. And right now, uh, as we speak, we are doing uh, uh, with a Mexican laboratory, which was first uh, allowed to use SARS-CoV-2 uh, to produce testing. We are producing also the, uh, the, uh, the tests to, to demonstrate that uh, it kills 99.9999 of coronavirus in 30 seconds, thanks to this uh, photo photosynthetic uh, structure. This uh, has been approved by the Mexican equivalent to the FDA, and the FDA has approved the gel version to be sold in the United States. And the reason I'm uh, mentioning this is because this was one of the, uh, uh, of, uh, the projects that we are pursuing with uh, a group of colleagues in uh, Purdue University uh, that uh, I will go into, into that. As uh, uh, AJ uh, mentioned it uh, during the panel, uh, in 1920 and in 2020, the main uh, technology that we have against uh, uh, COVID-19 is the mask. And uh, of course, it will be embarrassing for uh, all of us not to, to have an improved version of the mask that our uh, grand grandfathers used 100 years ago. So uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to collaborate with a bunch of very bright uh, young students, uh, Tania Purward, Antonio Esquivel, uh, John Quinones, and many others. Uh, in developing uh, new uh, uh, products based on uh, new ideas of science and technology. This is uh, uh, our proposal of a Nobel mask with a filter surface antivirus. Uh, we presented this paper, uh, which has the, the characteristic, among others, to be in interchangeable. Uh, and uh, thanks to the uh, facilities at the Purdue, we were able to test a number of uh, in, uh, interesting practical uh, characteristics of uh, these materials, of these masks. First, the pressure drop against velocity. One big problem why people don't like to wear masks is that the, it makes difficult, they make difficult to breathe. Uh, this is uh, a plot of having no mask what, uh, whatsoever, and we compared this with an N95 mask, uh, surgical mask, and our COVID filter. Our COVID filter is uh, the best in, uh, in, in terms of the, the drop of pressure uh, that is, is more bearable than the others. We also tested, of course, the uh, efficiency uh, of, this, uh, of these filters against uh, different viruses. Of course, uh, only recently, laboratories have been uh, allowed to test SARS-CoV-2 viruses, and uh, the, the laboratory in Purdue, we have no access to that. So we decided to, to use a model virus which is MS2 virus, which uh, has um, many resemblances uh, with the coronavirus in terms of the structure. This is the uh, uh, experimental setup, and uh, we were able to determine that uh, this filter, this mask, is uh, really efficient in, in terms of uh, protecting against the virus. Uh, the end of this uh, uh, research, 
is that the, our results show that the COVID filter is superior to the surgical mask and to the N19 mask. So to uh, give a little uh, hope to uh, AJ, uh, after 100 years, we were able to produce something that uh, is at least a little better than the mask that uh, were used in the 1920s. So that shows that, uh, again, having a map of how we are going to, to handle, how we are going to use the knowledge around, we will be able to produce uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, usable and is uh, uh, helpful to people. We have also uh, used this to produce a, a filter uh, for a robot. Uh, this is uh, 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 the diagram of these uh, several layers of our uh, mask that has a hydrophobic and lipophobic layer. I will go back to, to this concept, which is, uh, I think, very interesting. We also added, uh, as an innovation, a uh, diamond-like carbon uh, layer uh, that is very efficient in, uh, in killing uh, pathogens and a number of other uh, 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 layers that provide the functionality of, uh, of this. Uh, this robot uh, was uh, done in uh, collaboration with the group of uh, Professor Richard Boyle at the Purdue. Uh, and uh, it's been tested in, uh, uh, in uh, Purdue. Here you can see some pictures and there are some videos about this. And we also studied with uh, some of uh, the students associated to the group, how the particles expelled during breathing, coughing and sneezing affect different environments. And um, it is very surprising uh, again to see that the things that one could expect to begin with are not necessarily correct. And I go back to the concept of map. This uh, study, this uh, numerical simulation, uh, allowed us to have a mapping of how we have to deploy an, uh, a robot and how we are going to use uh, UV light and uh, filters and this uh, Nanoxin, this uh, uh, disinfectant that I just showed you a minute ago, to disinfect uh, uh, facilities first in campus and then uh, hopefully in the rest of, uh, of the country. And uh, for this matter, in the rest of the, of the world. Uh, we also uh, uh, produce some. Uh, Hello? Uh, we also produced some uh, uh, papers on how to deploy this robot in uh, different conditions uh, with uh, a number of colleagues in uh, China and in the United States. And then uh, let me discuss briefly with you a little about uh, physical chemistry of surfaces. I'm a physicist and I have worked most of my life with uh, uh, interaction between solid, gas, and uh, liquid interfaces. Here you have a diagram showing the different forces, interfacial forces, uh, be, uh, between a hydrophobic uh, a substrate like a polypropylene, uh, which is uh, the material from which uh, most uh, masks are made of, which is naturally hydrophobic, against a material that is uh, basically uh, poorly hydro hydrophobic, like a, like a glass. You can see that in some cases, the water wets the surface. In this case, the, the water uh, doesn't drop the surface. And what we have here is uh, a different uh, uh, configuration of the interfacial forces that depending on how you, you uh, play with them, could change the interactions within the, the, the water droplet. And uh, in this water droplet is where the, the tiny uh, viruses are contained. Remember that the COVID viruses are basically uh, uh, viruses that are covered by a lipidic, that is a greasy uh, surface. And if you are able to, to affect that uh, grease 
surface of the viruses, then you are able to, uh, in principle, annihilate or at least to an an uh, inactivate it. So what we uh, produce is a, a hydrophobic coating. You can see uh, how a droplet of water uh, on a standard aluminum looks like. And once the, uh, the coating, the hydrophobic coating is applied, you see how the, the material becomes from, from poorly hydrophobic to highly hydrophobic. And uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, we were able to see that just to using an hydrophobic surface, we can inactivate viruses. Uh, I think this is a, a very important uh, finding because uh, what I said, using uh, disinfectants and chemicals on a daily basis uh, will affect our health to the extent that nobody really knows. Whereas uh, by using just a physical chemical interaction of the viruses with the different surfaces uh, with which we uh, deal daily, namely uh, wood, uh, metals, uh, ceramics, plastics, and so on and so forth, we can reach up to 99% inactivation. The question is how we effectively disperse those uh, uh, nanoparticles that, uh, that uh, uh, form this uh, hydrophobic uh, surface, which is a patent that uh, I was granted in, nine, in 2019. Uh, and uh, to do that, we are using electrostatic spraying, which allows to, to do a much more homogeneous uh, spread of, uh, of uh, coatings on the surface. We are using this for two purposes. First, to be able to uh, spread more efficiently the uh, nanoxen, the disinfectant. And secondly, uh, to be able to uh, cover more homogeneously different surfaces with the same amount of uh, material. Okay, next skill. What we need to do. In the panel, we also discuss that uh, we need to think on the future. The future is going to be different from what we are used to in every respect, including social, scientific, and the technology aspects of it. So we need to generate in each of you, including, of course, the students, which are our main responsibility as professors, but also scholars, uh, uh, officials, uh, people responsible for doing or producing public policies and so on and so forth. We need to generate a, pr a prospective mind. Uh, a way to think not on what uh, we are living right now, but what prepare ourselves for what is uh, coming in the near future. Okay, let me show you some other aspects of the uh, pandemic that uh, perhaps is horrible to say, but this here is here. The increase of fraud. In uh, one of the things that uh, COVID has produced, in addition to all that you know, is a tremendous uh, amount of fraud, cyber crime. And it's uh, on the road, and uh, it has uh, represented a very serious uh, threat for the international uh, agencies. Uh, the Interpol and the OCDE had signed an agreement on uh, December 2020, three months ago, to produce innovative uh, measures against uh, cyber crime, in particular cyber fraud, because uh, the original ones are not uh, effective any longer. So what do we do? Let me introduce to you blockchain technology. This, uh, perhaps you have heard of uh, cryptocurrency. 
uh, bitcoins. Well, what's interesting here is that the, the technology behind could be also used for other applications. This is a diagram of how it works. You produce a new transaction. The transaction is transmitted to a, a network of peer-to-peer -peer computers. This network of computers solves very complex nonlinear equations to validate the, the validity of the transaction. Once it is confirmed, this information is clustered into blocks. And it's, it's, uh, it's so uh, efficient that this chain of uh, blocks create a history which is basically impossible. The probability of uh, being able to cheat with this technology, this blockchain technology is about 10 to the minus 30. So it's impossible. You can spend the rest of the, of the life of the universe trying to unblock this. So it's a very cute, very interesting technology which has been used only for this cryptocurrency. But this has also some other applications. One of the uh, things that uh, have been uh, uh, lately uh, very interestingly reported in the literature is are the NFT, non-fungible tokens. That is things like uh, pieces of art that do not exist physically, but have an existence in, uh, in the cyber world. Ha and uh, not long ago, the first piece of art which is a non-fungible token, was sold for several million dollars. And you can say, how I make sure that this really exists? Well, thanks to blockchain. You know that nobody can, uh, can uh, falsificate that, can produce a, 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 a fake a, a ver a version of what you have just uh, bought, and therefore your investment is safe. How we use that? Let's uh, talk again about education and institutions. Educational institutions like Purdue, like the National University of Mexico, spend a lot of time doing uh, repetitive work. Most of the institutions in 2020 produce a paper certificates, and this reaches only a small part of the students. It is very time consuming. It is very expensive and need this very fragile because it could be uh, uh, very, very easily uh, fake. Just to uh, give you a, a piece of information, the National University of Mexico calculates that about 10% of the titles that has, has granted are fake. So because to people it's um, much cheaper to go and get a, a fake uh, title from the University of Mexico than uh, to go through all the process of the education. This is a big problem all over the world. Uh, the uh, market of this uh, certification in, in uh, educational institutions in Europe, in Latin America, is about $1.5 billion a year. And uh, how this relates to COVID. This is a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, dated uh, March 31st, 2021. So it's only a couple of weeks old. And it discusses the vaccine passport, policy and ethical considerations. Some countries and some organizations are proposing the issuing a passport vaccine to be able to travel all over the world. And this has pros and cons. The main con uh, uh, is that the, this is a study uh, made all over the world. Uh, and what they found is that people don't trust the government for several reasons and in most cases with uh, very good reasons. So, because they don't think those passports, those documents are going to be reliable. What to do? Well, 
we are starting a project at the National University of Mexico with this company. This is a startup uh, of some uh, Mexican and Colombian students that work with me. They won uh, a prize at MIT and uh, won uh, uh, this uh, grant to uh, develop this company certified. And uh, we are uh, uh, using now this technology first to issue all the certificates uh, that are issued by the National University of Mexico. The National University of Mexico has 350,000 students. It's one of the largest universities in the world. And you can imagine the amount of uh, certificates that it has to issue, not every year, but every day. And uh, we hope to be uh, among the very first in the world to be able to certificate. And our second uh, goal is to be able to use this for health certificates, to use the technology uh, with a this perspective uh, vision to be able to deal with uh, what is coming about. A uh, complete uh, uh, feeling of uh, lack of confidence on what we are doing. We need to develop methods to be able to uh, gain again the confidence of the public all over the world. And just let me finish with my, uh, with the last skill I think we need to survive this pandemic. Be always optimistic. In spite of that, this is a great world to, to live in and uh, the future is still there. This is a special message for our, our younger people. We leave you a very complex, very complicated, very unfair world, but uh, with your capacity and your optimism, you can make it much better. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Victor, for a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your remarks. Um, uh, so, and I'm glad you finished up with uh, uh, something optimistic. So uh, that's something uh, that we can all uh, look forward to and uh, move the world. Uh, I uh, have to announce that we have a hard stop at uh, 5.30 because Victor will have to uh, run yet to another meeting. We, uh, we keep him quite busy today. Uh, but we have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question if you like, or you can write uh, a question uh, in the in the chat box if you want to uh, go ahead, and we can uh, we can monitor that. Luciano, I see you are on. Yes, uh, thank you, Eckhart. Victor, thank you for a great talk. Uh, Victor, I have a question. You, you mentioned one of the important uh, solutions to reduce the fraud in the future uh, due to COVID and everything else is to use blockchain. But I, I have a question for you. I, I saw in BBC an article that said that if, if cryptocurrency, the blockchain was a country, it would consume more energy than England. So we moved to blockchain, but now you're in a problem that countries, right? We have over a billion people without access to reliable electricity. Now you bring in a big problem for countries, the inequality gap that we were talking about. So how you propose to deal with that issue that many other countries will not have the energy power to do the calculations required for blockchain? Uh the, you are raising a very important uh, point. Uh, I have uh, participated with a couple of companies uh, based on um, uh, blockchain that have not been successful exactly for the reason you mentioned. Uh, they have no access to the energy for the, all the computer time that the, is required. Uh, there are many uh, uh, approaches to solve that. One of them is, is of course, to develop uh, new, more reliable, cheaper, and uh, available uh, energy uh, sources. But the other one is, uh, has to do with the question that was raised at the panel. We need to change our minds and uh, uh, realizing, uh, by realizing that the, we humans 
are not isolated. Doesn't matter that uh, I got vaccinated uh, if uh, my next door uh, neighbor is not vaccinated. Doesn't matter if I'm rich, if the people that surrounded me uh, have no nothing to eat. Doesn't matter if I have energy, if the people around have no energy to produce reliable uh, sources uh, of energy. So uh, what I'm trying to say here, I guess, is that uh, we need to change our, our mind. And one way to, to produce that is to uh, use the countries, the uh, uh, facilities. Uh, remember that this is uh, uh, virtual, so you can just collect the data and send the data uh, all over the world. Uh, this company that I'm talking about uh, began using uh, uh, some uh, uh, clouds, uh, clouding computing in the United States, and now is moving to uh, to Switzerland because of the reason uh, that you are you are exactly mentioning. So that's a big challenge, a big problem, and those are the type of things that open opportunities to to develop more technology, but technology with a social conscience. Thank you. Thank you, Luciana. Uh, anybody else? If not, I would like to ask the question right, uh, my, uh, myself that, uh, and that relates to uh, what you just mentioned, right? Uh, we're looking uh, quite often for engineers to provide solutions uh, and the, about the interaction with the social science uh, becomes quite obvious. We had this also as part of the earlier panel discussion. Um, but as part of this puzzle, I think there's a, a need for the engineers or for, uh, to educate uh, also just uh, uh, in general on, edu uh, on engineering principles. All our engineering students take uh, what we call uh, general education electives, but I always feel there's a need for everybody else to take basic engineering principles. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you see we, we can roll this out? How can we raise the engineering level, knowledge level in uh, the society um, so that we can tackle, I think, uh, these problems better, more combined with, uh, with, uh, with the general population? Uh, I think we uh, academicians and we engineers need to develop uh, uh, more precise and effective social communications technologies. That is how we are able to communicate what we do so people realize that uh, what uh, engineering and science does is important to them. It's not only a matter of uh, crazy people that are love to be reading papers and uh, doing uh, crazy experiments at the lab, but the things that affect their, uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, daily life. I always thought that communication is a two components process. On the one end is the, uh, emit, um, uh, the, the person who emits the, the, uh, the, uh, the message, and on the other end, the people who receive the message. And we scientists tend to, to forget about the first one. We want to be heard when we have nothing to communicate. It's uh, self-criticism, and I think we need to provide our engineering students with uh, communications abilities, in addition to math, in addition to, to physics, which of course are wonderful, but we need them to also be able to communicate the relevance, uh, relevance of what they do. Thank you, Victor. Uh, okay. Jerry has yeah. a question. Yeah, this is Tere Carvajal. I'm in agriculture and biological engineering, and I have worked with also with material surface, mater uh, surface properties of materials. Anyhow, my question is, uh, in, with regards to the mask that you are developing, I wonder what will be the conditions of, like you were saying, we have to be social or humanistic thinking. What about the environment with regards to the materials that you are you will be using for making the mask? Uh, what will be the ways? And my second question is, how often you have to change that mask? Because some people 
uses is not effective, of course, but uh, using the, the 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 cloth with some filter, they change it often or they wash the mask. So, what what will be the situation of this new mask that you are developing that's supposed to be very effective? Well, uh, you have raised a very important problem: the amount of uh, waste produced by uh, mask and uh, PPE, personal protection equipment, including gloves, masks, and uh, gowns, and everything, has increased exponentially in the last 12 months. So that's another problem we are going to face uh, sooner than later, which is the amount of uh, waste. So there are two uh, answers to your question. First, uh, to produce uh, things that can be uh, uh, used several times, if you notice uh, 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 what we uh, show, uh, the idea is that uh, you can wear that several times uh, as a part of your uh, gar garment, your uh, scarf, or part of your, uh, your clothes every day. So the answer is that yes, we are planning to have this uh, to be used and reused several times. And the second part is uh, to reuse that by effectively disinfecting. And that's why we also want uh, to, de uh, we are developing this uh, electrostatic spraying to uh, uh, being able to disinfect after a given number of uses, the, uh, the mask and, uh, and uh, have a long-term uh, uh, use of, of, uh, of this device uh, to, pre to reduce the amount of uh, garbage that is uh, produced. Thank you so much. And I really wanted to say as well that I enjoy very much your talk. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I got the, the signal. Uh, I need to close this out. Uh, so, uh, Victor, thank you very much again for uh, a tremendous uh, presentation, uh, mind provoking uh, ideas. Uh, and. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us and answering our questions. And um, with that, I will close out this session. And uh, uh, thank you for everyone else who was uh, on uh, on our web meeting today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.